Amen. Well, I have a confession to make. Um, and it's that when I got married, I was not a very good husband. And three years later, my wife and I were celebrating three-year anniversary in two months. And I still love it. Still recommend getting married, still love it, uh, but two months, and even now, I'm still not as good of a husband as I would like to be. Can I just ask, can I talk to the wives for a second? Where are the wives at? Can I ask you a question? Okay, question, question. Just be honest. How many of you, your husband has made a husband fail? Just be honest. Husband <laughs> fail. I want to see it. Come on. Thank you for your honesty there. Uh, so I made a big husband fail just a, a month ago. It was my wife's birthday. Uh, and we didn't really have time uh, to, to do any sort of major celebration. We were really busy that week. And so I told her, I was like, hey, uh, my, I know my wife uh, well enough to know that she likes two things, gifts and shopping. Okay, any ladies agree? Yes, gifts and shopping. So gifts and shopping. So I was like, hey, what if we do this? Instead of me giving you a gift, what if we went shopping for your birthday? Uh, and she said, yes, that's great. And so what you all seem to know about my life is that she is spontaneous she is fun. She is the life of the party. When she walks into a room, there's color, there's joy, there's angels at her back. Like, she's just the fun one. For me, I, I am, and how many, some of you might be more like me, I'm like a planner. Like, like, I will be the life of the party if it's on the calendar and if the job life of the party is assigned to me. So, like, once a year... I'll do it, but the rest of the time, I'm, I'm into plans, and so, anyways, so we go shopping, and I sent her off to this clothes store, and I have this idea, I'm like, I'm going to sneak into a store and buy her an awesome gift and surprise her, because that's the third thing she loves, gift shopping surprises, so I was like, I'm going to surprise her with a gift, and, and so I see, and there, I, I walk into, like, this stationary store, and that's when I see it, on the shelf, this beautiful, gorgeous, on-sale planner. <laughs> over me in that moment, maybe just that, hey, if I was a girl, I would love this pink planner to organize my life and my thoughts. And so I buy it, I put it in this bag, put some pens in it, uh, we go to celebrate her birthday, she, I surprise her with the gift, she's all surprised, uh, she opens it up and she says, a planner. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that is the last time we talked about that planner. <laughs> Where even is it? I don't even know where it is. Okay, we don't have to worry about that. I'm not as good of a husband as I would like to be. I'm not as changed as I would like to be. And as we think about our Christian lives, our lives following Jesus, the goal of the Christian life is becoming more and more like Jesus. Leaving our anxiety behind and experiencing peace. Leaving our depression behind and experiencing joy. Leaving our judgment and emotional distance behind and experiencing love. Uh, so I just want to, can I just ask us some questions? I want to ask us a series of questions, just five questions. And here's what I mean. I believe the Holy Spirit loves uh, to speak uh, through the power of a question. How many of you believe that? The Holy Spirit loves to speak through the power of a good question. So I'm going to ask us just some questions, just to kind of look at our hearts. We believe being a discipling church means we are actively seeking to be changed into the image of Jesus. Being a discipling church means we are actively seeking to be changed into the image of Jesus. So I'm going to ask you, are you more anxious or less anxious than you were a year ago? Or about the same? And I just want to encourage you, if one of these questions speaks to you, maybe jot it down real quick, make a mental note, keep it in the back of your head throughout this, uh, this teaching. And number two, are you more present in your most important relationships or less present than you were a year ago or about the same? Is your life slowing down or speeding up? Are you at peace during challenges or are you growing more resentful at God for allowing challenges in your life? Last question. Are you even aware of your inner world? Or is your life so filled with hurry, rush, commitments, stress that you don't really know how to answer these questions? Are we changing into the image of Jesus. How do we transform changed people, change culture, but how do we transform? I want to look, if we're going to be a discipling church, a church that disciples leaders, how many of you think it's important 
to look at Jesus' definition for discipleship. Now, this is Jesus' definition for discipleship. Matthew chapter 16, um, he says this. Matthew 16 is kind of our focus text for this series. In, in Matthew 16, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is Jesus' definition of discipleship. Jesus' definition of this is how you change. You have to give up your life. That's good news this morning, okay? Maybe it's not good news. Maybe you came to church for a feel-good message. This is the message of Jesus. In order to be a disciple, in order to follow him, we have to give up our lives. Can I tell you a personal story that's quite transparent for me to share? How many of you think pastors should lie on Sunday mornings? Do you want a pastor that lies? How many pastors should be real and honest, real and honest? So... uh, Last, about a year ago, last October, uh, I, I had a crippling panic attack. And what it looks like for me is I, it was a Saturday before I preached, and, and what I ended up doing is I was, uh, got, got, kind of had some anxious thoughts in my head. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but it was like, I had an anxious thought in my head, and then I got anxious about my anxiety. And then I got anxious about my anxiety, about my anxiety. And then it was like this spiral. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'm just beyond. I mean, it's just anxiety spirals to the point where I'm walking around my neighborhood and it's like I have tunnel vision. I can't see anything around me. And my mind is so overwhelmed that it's blank. And I end my walk probably two hours on the floor of my room, just a ball of anxiety and fear. And that was about a year ago. I ended up seeing a a therapist just to be like, what the heck just happened to me? And the therapist says, you have anxiety. That was a panic attack. And I didn't know what it was because I never experienced it before. But that just started me on this process really over the last year. And this was the question that I was asking myself. I'm following Jesus. I'm supposed to be changing more into the image of Jesus. How come I'm more anxious now than I was when I started following Jesus? What happened? What's going on in my life? Why am I not changing uh, the way that I, I should? And, and I really think there's a key in this passage where Jesus says the key to change and transformation is you have to give up your life in order to save your soul. And what I started to do, and really I even tried over this year and had many moments of breakdown as I tried to get better at time management. I tried to pray more. I tried to read more books. I tried to go to church and do all these things and listen to sermons. But what I was doing is I wasn't laying down some of the things in my life. Instead, I was trying to just add Christian things on top of it. And as a result, my soul crumbled into anxious fear. I think I might be talking to some of us this morning. And so when we talk about laying down our life, the life that Jesus promised us, he says the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came so that you might have abundant life. Here's my question. Are we experiencing the abundant life that Jesus promised? Or are we just as stressed out, just as anxious, just as overworked, just as depressed as the people in culture? That's a question I want to ask. And how do we transform? You have to give up your life. Um, Really, I think... uh, let me, let me go here. Let me go here. So really, so I'll just finish my journey, and then I'll show you some practical things for us. But uh, So what happened is I, I tried all these different things. I tried to fix it on my own. I tried to add things to my life. And, and then what ended up happening is I was in this discipleship group, and the leader of the discipleship group encouraged us uh, to practice this spiritual practice called silence and solitude. I've never heard of that before. Silence and solitude. And I was like, oh, man, I do that. Like, I pray every morning. Like, I, I listen to my audio Bible in the car. Like, I do that. And I kind of explained what I was doing. And he's like, no, silence and solitude. That means you have to be quiet and alone. I was like, oh. So I was like, okay, but I'll, like, I'll like pray. And he's like, no, this is a type of prayer, but you're not praying with words. You're praying with your silence. And so I was like, oh. I think I responded like this. I was like, oh man. So I was like, I'm gonna do, I set my timer for 10 minutes, sat out on my porch, 
So I'm going to be quiet for 10 minutes. And here's what I noticed. And maybe I just want to ask us honestly, for some of us, if we really were to turn off the music, if we really were to turn down the noise, if we really were to get by ourselves, what would come up in our souls? And so I did. I got there and immediately all this anxiety comes up. And my default is I wanted to start praying. But then I realized, I remembered what the guy had said. He said, hey, you can't, you can't pray. You're praying with your silence. And all of a sudden, I realized, man, like, even my praying, I'm praying to cover up the pain of the anxiety that's in my heart. I've never just faced this with the Lord. Yeah. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, man, there's some anxiety here. There's some uh, depression in here. There's some fear in here. There's some uh, fear of approval. There's this planning. Here's what I realized. Maybe some of you are like this. I realized in, my, in this time, I could not even stop planning what I was going to do next. Mm-hmm. And it's brought me to this point of uh, complete surrender. And, and in that moment, and really it took, I mean, and I'm still in this. It's not like I'm good at silence and solitude. In fact, I tried to do it this morning, and I'm like planning my message. I'm like, no, just I'm here with God in this moment. But what starts to happen is after I'm able to kind of acknowledge that stuff, that brokenness, set it aside, we, I begin to encounter God's presence at the core of who I was. And here's what I believe. And we're in a journey, we're in a process, but this is my kind of thesis, is that what God uses to change and transform us is his presence. Yes. What God uses to change and to transform us is his presence. But we have to put ourselves in the place so that his presence can encounter us. Right. It's kind of like that. You guys know the story of the potter and the potter's wheel? Um, it, it's a, you know, we are this, this gross lump of clay, right? How many of you are sitting next to a gross lump of clay? Um, <laughs> So it's this lump of clay, and then God's the beautiful potter, and he's taking our brokenness, he's taking our weakness, he's taking our frailness, and he's shaping us into the image of Jesus. Perfect love, perfect joy, perfect peace, perfect relational presence. But the tool that he's using to do it is his presence. And what gets us on the potter's wheel are these spiritual practices like silence and solitude. And I think for some of us, we're not changing in our lives because instead of laying down our lives, picking up practices like silence, solitude, and this would be a whole sermon series just to list them, but they're classic spiritual disciplines the church has done for ages. Prayer, uh, fasting, uh, uh, celebration, confession. We have to engage in these disciplines to put ourselves on the potter's wheel and then God transforms us into the image of Jesus. Here's my question for us. Are we, are we putting ourselves on the potter's wheel? Or are we just kind of showing up on a Sunday morning and hoping God waves his magic wand and changes us? So we have to give up our life in order to get on the potter's wheel, in order to engage in these practices. Because um, here's what this message is not. This message is not about doing more things. I've tried it. I tried praying more. I tried fasting more. I tried going to more discipleship groups, listening to more podcasts. Doing more stuff will never change us. Only God's presence can change us. And so what does that look like? Well, we have to, like Jesus said, again, how many think it's a good idea to follow Jesus? Again, give up our lives. We have to give up our lives. So what are our lives? Here's what I want to suggest this morning. I want to suggest that our lives are the things that we do. And for many of us, we can't imagine adding spiritual practices like prayer, like fasting, like Sabbath, because our lives are so full. Um, but in reality, we, our lives are full, and we fill them with practices that we accidentally do. And these are our life. I want to show you a list. I came up with a, a little list of accidental practices, things that without even thinking about it, growing up in American culture, we just do. We worry. We hit the snooze button. Any snoozers? In this room, snoozers, come on. All the college students raise their hands. <laughs> Any, uh, you know, double tapping, scrolling, rushing to events, always running slightly late. Is there anyone in here that's perfectly on time all the time? Amazing. Uh, Any of us run a little bit late most of the time, and we're rushing, and we're anxious, and, and we overthink. Any overthinkers in the room, okay? Uh, And then we underthink. Any underthinkers in the room who really disengage and probably should think more? Uh, Overeating, skipping meals, overcommitting, picking the shortest line 
in the grocery store. <laughs> Out of a desire to rush, get to the next thing, fueled by anxiety, and the favorite word of Americans, and it's the word hurry. Everyone say hurry. hurry. We're hurrying. Um, here's another one, switching lanes to be in the fastest lane. Come on, how many of you do this? You switch lanes, because we're in a rush, right? We can't slow down eating really fast. Um, I, I, I thought of another one in between services that I, that I'd add to this if I could. It's always saying yes to people and never saying no. One of my favorite things that Pastor Bob has ever said, actually my two favorite things, okay, I don't want to say the first one, but the second favorite thing that Pastor Bob has ever said is, um, is if you never say no, your yes doesn't mean anything. If you never say you no, know, your yes doesn't mean anything. But this is what happens. Inadvertently, we order our lives, and literally, again, I told you this would be practical. I, some of you are waiting for like some revelation. Like, this is the revelation. What are you doing Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday afternoon? Are we filling our lives with these things? What are you filling your life with? What are the practices that you're filling your life with? And here's what uh, kind of we believe is that the roots in our life are going to produce fruit. Okay, I know it's a little cheesy, but come on. The roots in our life are going to produce some fruit. The roots in our life are going to produce some fruit. Here's a picture. I think for a lot of us, what happens is we inadvertently fill Monday through Sunday worrying, snoozing, overthinking, rushing, overcommitting, just trying to get to the next thing. I mean, I grew up, what I accidentally learned growing up was life was about getting to the next vacation. Maybe some of you, that's a root. It's just my life is about getting to the next day off, getting to the next vacation. But what happens is those roots produce the fruit in our life of anger, disappointment, anxiety, shame, depression, fear, jealousy. And what I used to do when I saw that fruit of anxiety in my life, I tried to just go up and take it off the tree. And that didn't work. It grew back. And then I tried. I was like, I'm going to pray more. And I tried to hang a little prayer fruit next to the anxiety fruit. It didn't work. The anxiety was still there. So I had to go on this journey of changing the roots in my life so I could show different fruits. Being a discipling church means that we are committed to make spiritual practices the foundation of our lives, not an add-on. I want to tell you, it's hard news. It's not easy news. If our lives are filled with these things, anxiety, fear, all this stuff, we can't add on Sunday services. We can't add on listening to the Christian radio real quick on the way to work. We have to utterly lay down our lives and change the foundation that we're standing on. And the way Christians have done this for 2,000 years and even more, there's, there's roots of it back in Jewish practices, is these spiritual practices of prayer, silence, solitude, fasting, Sabbath. How many know what Sabbath is? It's taking a, a day off to enjoy the people that God's placed around you. Uh, if you make these things the root, I want to show you what fruit you get. If you make silence, Sabbath, celebration, confession, prayer the roots of your life, you get love. Peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, joy, and goodness. How many want some more of those fruits in your life? Jesus said it this way. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man or wise person who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Is the foundation of our life the Western American way of rushing, hurrying, overcommitting? Or is the foundation of our life our relationship with God? Amen. Prayer, fasting, prioritizing His presence. You know, Christianity, when it first started, was, it was called the way. Everyone say the way. The way. Because the early Christians understood, you can even see it in Acts, they, they call themselves, they were followers of the way. Because they understood they weren't just a belief system. They weren't just a group that met together. There was actually a way that they were supposed to live. Right. And for 2,000 years to disciple somebody 
has meant to take them through these spiritual practices. It's really only in the last, if you trace the history of discipleship in the church, it's really only in the last 50 years since the consumer church culture exploded that we've made discipleship classes, programs, pamphlets, books. For 2,000 years, it's been taking people through spiritual practices. Being a discipling church means our primary goal in life is becoming like Jesus. And really, I want to encourage us, this isn't, uh, this is so easy to hear this as an add-on to our life's message. It's actually a way we think message. And for some of us, we're so used to thinking the way that, because here's the reality, if we don't put ourselves on God's potter's wheel, guess what potter's wheel we're on? Our own, the culture's. And we start to learn that the way to live is by rushing, by hurrying, by anxiety, by overcommitting, by saying yes to too many things. And we start to look more like a, a person in American culture than somebody who's following the way of Jesus. And so we have to choose uh, to get on the potter's wheel. And it's a mindset shift. And I think, and this is kind of the last point here, and I actually have a friend who's going to come up and share an illustration uh, that goes along with this. But here's kind of the, the test of if we're on culture's potter's wheel or if we're on Jesus's potter's wheel. So who wants to be on Jesus's potter's wheel? I just want to check before you share. So here's culture's potter's wheel is when problems and challenges come in our life. How many of you, I just want to make sure this is relevant. Has anyone ever faced a, a problem or a challenge? Okay, sweet. So if you never have, you can just hang on for just a second. This is for the people who's faced some problems. Okay. If you're on culture's potter's wheel and you're facing challenges, the questions that we tend to ask are why and what. Number one, why is this happening to me? To be honest, how many of you ever asked that in a challenge before? Why is this happening to me? Because we believe culture's narrative is that if we just do enough good things, our life will get better. And so we say, man, why is this happening to me? I am a good person. This should be happening to my neighbor, Jim. He sucks. I'm good. <laughs> right? How many of us think like that? Why is this happening to me? And then the number two question we ask is what? Okay? Some of us are really good what-ers. What do I need to do to get out of this challenge? Come on, have you asked that one? What do I need to do to get out of, out of this challenge? And so that the what, it also betrays this belief that, oh my gosh, I just have to do all the right things and then my life gets better. Clearly I'm not doing something right and I should fix it and then my life will get better. So we ask why, why is this happening to me? And what do I need to do to get out of it? And as a result, we're, we're taking ourselves off the potter's wheel. We're taking ourselves off of that journey of becoming in the image and likeness of Jesus. If we're facing a challenge, being a discipling church means we're not asking the questions why or what. We're asking the question, who is God shaping me to be? Amen. Who am I becoming? I just want to say, I think for some of us, we've been facing challenges and the questions in our heart have been, why is this going on? What do I need to do to go out of it? And God's keeping you in the challenge, not as a punishment, but because his main plan is to form the image of Jesus in you. And there's some of us in here, we fit, some of us, I even sensed, I felt the Lord say this morning, 10 years. Some of us have been in 10 years of challenges. And your question is, Lord, why me? What do I need to do, get, to do to get out of this? I'm done. And God's just trying to make you look more like Jesus. And I think some of us, we need to be jealous of the people who go through a lot of trials. Because they're probably going to look more like Jesus than the rest of us. You think I'm crazy? This is literally what the New Testament's about. James chapter 1 says this, says, count it joy. Everyone say joy. joy. Not even like half joy, pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete like Jesus not lacking anything. Consider it a joy when you face a trial. And let's be honest, many of us probably right now are in a trial. Consider it joy because God's forming the image of his son in us. Richard Rohr says it this way. He says, we change our circumstances to avoid changing our character. Are we changing? Changed people change culture. We're here to disciple leaders that transform culture. We're not trying to host more trips, do more events, do more things. Our goal is to change us 
into the image of Jesus, and then wherever changed people go, culture changes. What would it look like this year, 2020, if we, the rock, could be a people that, like Jesus, woke up early to pray? And as a result, where culture says, that's ridiculous to wake up early to pray. That's ridiculous to go to a prayer room. You should be making money. You should be rushing. You should be doing other things. What if we, like Jesus, committed to pray, and as a result, we had a peace that the world could only imagine of? Here's my fear. When we're talking about mission, when we're talking about salvation, if we're honest with ourselves, I don't want to save people to a, a, a church that's anxious, depressed, joyless, that life kind of just sucks. We're just as committed as everybody else. And we go to church too. Like who wants to be saved to like all the commitments that people have plus going to church too, plus going to Bible study. Like that's exhausting. We have to have the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, righteousness, self-control. What would it look like if we could be a people that practice relational presence in our meals together? And as a result, we have a love that the world could only dream of. What would it look like if we could practice, and this is a radical one, practice taking a day off as a family to celebrate and enjoy each other, and as a result, we have a peace that the world can only dream of. We're going to follow the way of Jesus, friends. Well, I have a friend uh, that I want to come to invite share with us just to give a practical uh, picture kind of of what this looks like. He is the Placer County Director of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And here's what I'm excited to bring him up is he's doing something instrumental uh, with high schoolers in this region. He's going to be a major part uh, of how we are moving forward as the youth and college ministries here at The Rock in 2020. So will you stand up and welcome Clay Rojas. Now I know why we have a um, children and middle school ministry. I'm sitting there with my kids, and I'm like, one of them's holding on to me. I'm like, okay, you got to let go. She's like, why? I was like, I have to go up there. She's like, no. <laughs> no, I have to go up there, really. Um, I want to start by sharing a scripture with you all. It's out of uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, and here's what it says. It says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. Can we say all things? All things. Not some things, all things. And count them as rubbish or garbage. In order that I may gain Christ. We're, we're doing ministry on high school campuses. And a couple of months ago, I was at Granite Bay High School. Anybody from Granite Bay High? Okay, good. Um, so, I was on campus at Granite Bay. And I was there during, uh, during the club rush. You all know what club rush is? Uh, it's like the first couple of weeks back at school and all the different clubs on campus are displaying their, here's what we do and, and, and we want you to join us because it's, it's really cool. So I am there representing Fellowship of Christian Athletes with my group and we're doing our thing. We're talking to kids about what is FCA, why should you join, talking to them about faith and all those other things. And out of the corner of my eye, I see a group that catches my eye. And there's a group of about eight or nine girls and two boys. And I look over there. And, the, and do you guys want to know why they caught my eye? Because one of them was carrying Morgan's planner. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No. I know where that planner is, by the way. Uh, I look over there. And they caught my eye because um, it was the students uh, Muslim Association and these girls they were wearing their hijab okay they were wearing their, their headscarves and immediately I said to myself here's a group that is going against the grain of what our culture and society is saying is beautiful or sexy or attractive like they don't care about any of that they just know that they are on a mission and their mission is to spread their faith and to share their faith with others and they don't care what other people think and so here I am I'm looking at them and I also see another group of students who are making fun of them and they're just kind of pointing and laughing and they're laughing at the scarves and you know just they're just kind of being mean teens okay and um, and I said to myself uh, wow like someone has discipled these students 
to count popularity lost to count being cool lost to count being the you know the, the most popular kid on campus and having all you know the coolest clothes on, that, that doesn't mean anything to them and after it was all said and done I walked over there and I talked to them and I said you know you guys have really blessed me today and you know this young lady's looking at my shirt and I have a big cross on it and she's like how could how can I bless you if you're a Christian and I'm a Muslim and immediately this scripture came to my mind Philippians 3 8 they they've written that off and church these students were, were discipled by family members, church members, friends, um, fellow students. Whose job is it to disciple our future generation? We're, we're, earlier we were talking about the next leaders of Haiti. They're being discipled, but everyone plays a role. So if you're sitting in here today and you're saying, how do we disciple the future leaders of our church, the future leaders of our community, so that with FCA and with all of our other church partners, we create a group of disciples, not converts. Yeah. See, yeah. converts run at the first sign of persecution. Yeah. Right? Converts run at the first sign of persecution. Here's how the whole story kind of came back. I'm, I'm, I'm at the back at the FCA table, and a young man asks me for a Bible. We're talking, he asked me for a Bible, and when I get ready to give him the Bible, he kind of looks around because he just make, wants to make sure no one's watching. And he says, hey, can, he's really low. Hey, can you stuff it in my backpack? Because he's ashamed that someone will see him walking with the Bible. And I'm thinking to myself, we got the real thing. We got the real thing and we're ashamed of walking with Bibles. They don't have the real thing and they're living and dying for something that they believe in because They've been discipled to believe that this life is a write-off. Church, the message that Ryan's bringing, change people, change culture, we all play a role in it. But we have to ask ourselves a question, how much time and energy am I putting into making my life more comfortable? Versus how much time and energy am I putting into silence and solitude and, and creating a life where I can be discipled and then I can create other disciples that will create other disciples that will create other disciples. Amen. This is the mission that we're on and, and everyone sitting in this room right now plays a part in that so that we can create the next generation who is unashamed of having the real thing and we're walking through our campuses and guess what? Those others are looking at us. There's going to be a day when they're going to look at us and say, what is it that you have? Because I want that. Because our students are going to be disciples who are walking unashamed with the presence of God on these campuses. And I believe that others, just like that day when I looked at them, and I, and I was amazed at how unashamed they were of their faith, there will be a day on these campuses where others will look at us, the followers of the way, the followers of Jesus, and they will say, what is it that you have? Because I want that. Yeah. Right? right? Amen? And it happens... When all of us participate in this discipleship making movement. Amen? Amen. All right. Here's what I want to play, Jesha. I love you say we all have a part to play. You know, this series really is uh, our, our who we are why we're here, and where we're going for 2020 series. And so I want to Clay to come up here because he's an integral part of kind of youth and college's piece of the puzzle. But I love what you said, that we all have a part to play uh, in this next year. I mean, uh, how many of you would love to be in a movie someday? you love to be in a movie. All right, so not a lot. That's okay. So we all have a part to play in the movie of 2020. I was trying an illustration. didn't work. That's okay. So we all have a job. This year, to disciple leaders, transform culture, change people, uh, change culture. And I just want to celebrate uh, kind of with Clay uh, what youth and college's piece of the puzzle is. I want to show a picture of uh, Josh preaching at, at Antelope High School. So this is Antelope High School. Uh, this is the fellowship. Are you from Antelope? Come on. Okay. Uh, this is the fellowship of Christian athletes. So this is student. So here's kind of our mission, okay? Here's our mission is we want to disciple leaders, the transform culture, meaning my job is somebody on the church staff is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So who should be doing the ministry? All of us. 
And so kind of our model for reaching campuses is we as staff disciple groups of high school students who then run missional communities on their campuses. And this is a picture of that. This is our Antelope High School uh, missional community in partnership with FCA. The reason why we partner with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes is because FCA is this magic word on campuses. Like literally, it's been so hard for me to go on campuses as a pastor. I walk in, I say, I'm with FCA and Clay Rojas. And the office ladies part like the Red Sea. I tell you, it's a miracle. Like, I just walk in and then find my students. And then, so here's a picture of their outreach in the library. They've done this twice so far. Gathered a hundred students in the library. That's my friend Josh. Preaching the gospel. Last week, we did this. Alex Martinez, who many of you know, preached his story. Uh, and each time, we're giving re- opportunities for students to respond to the gospel. And, and more than 10 students have said yes uh, to follow Jesus. to disciple leaders that transform culture, we connect them to the students that we're training and leading on that campus and they invite them to their missional communities. Right now, we just want to celebrate with you. We have three uh, student-run campus communities that are running right now. And our goal, and you can pray for us this year, is to see five by next fall. Okay, so pray for us. Pray for campus doors to open. Um, let's close. I'm going to have Clay pray for us. Well, let's, um, can we just, you can take that off. Can we put the, um, can we put the, um, the, the, the graphic, that cool graphic? That little one that I made. Yay! Okay, so here's how we're going to make this practical. Let's stand up together. Let's stand up. Sam or someone can come to the keys. I just want you to look. I just want you to take a personal inventory of maybe this on the left right here are things that, if you're honest with yourself, maybe if you were to be silent and alone and turn down the noise, turn off the music, turn off the rush, turn off the busyness, might come up in your heart. Anger, disappointment, depression, anxiety, shame, fear, insecurity. There's a whole list of them. Maybe you clearly know something else. Uh, What's the one thing that you know is a piece of brokenness that's still in your soul? And then on the other side, over here, grace, generosity, joy. That's one of our visions for 2020. We're going to be a church of grace, generosity, joy. But there's some other fruit of the Spirit there. What's the fruit of the Spirit that Jesus is inviting you into that's the opposite of that piece of brokenness? That's in your soul. So just pick one on the left, pick one on the right. And then what I want you to do is kind of ask the Lord for revelation or understanding. Pick one of those spiritual practices in yellow that will help you, uh, that will help you to be changed more into the image of Jesus. Do you think God might want to use in your life as a vehicle for presence to shape that in you? And One of my favorite quotes is a Dallas Willard quote that says, grace isn't, uh, or grace is opposed to earning, but it isn't opposed to effort. And so we talk about this, we're not talking about trying hard, we're talking about stepping into God's grace, and it's not earning it, but it is putting forth some effort to say, God, what are you doing in me? What are you shaping in me? So I want to respond to this together. If you're going to close your eyes and put your hands out, like Pastor Bob talked about in a posture of receiving, You know, as we talk about brokenness in our souls, it can get kind of uncomfortable because we want to run away from it and we want to pretend that we've got it all worked out. But I just feel like right now God's highlighting to some of us our need for the grace of God to change. And I just want to say, I just feel like some people in here need to invite God uh, to change them by His grace. So just with eyes closed, if you're saying, you know what, this has made me aware of maybe some issues in my life I've been running to, But I want to ask for God's grace to come and invade those areas. Just with eyes closed, can you lift your hand? If that's you, you've got some areas you need God's grace to invade. Lord, we invite your grace to come. We invite grace, grace, grace. We're not earning your approval and love, but God, you meet us right where we're at. And specifically, I want to pray. I I talked a lot about kind of my journey with anxiety and stress and I recognize that there's, I mean, obviously I got a clinical diagnosis of anxiety. There's clinical diagnoses, and then there's just general struggles. I believe Jesus wants to help us with both. So if you're in this room, just with eyes closed, you say, you know, I've got some anxiety in my heart, and I want to give it to God this morning. I want to offer it up to his grace. Just raise your hand if that's you. God, we surrender our anxiety to you, our fear to you, our stress to you. I want to add to this, if you've got a sense of sadness and depression that just lingers with you, clinical or not clinical, again, just with eyes closed, lift your hand for that. God, we pray for your love to invade our hearts. We invite Clay to pray for us. Thank you, 
you, Jesus. Church, I believe God is, is inviting us to be brave. Brave enough to go against the culture that says to be a person of many things is successful. To be a person on the go is success. To be a person that's so busy that you can't stop to kiss your wife or hug your kids is successful. And today we just pray, God, that you would just make us brave enough to be a person of one thing. Jesus, I want to be a person of one thing. And though there are many things to do, make me like Mary of Bethany. Nudge me, Holy Spirit, to sit at the feet of Jesus and just be a son and just be a daughter without having to feel like I have to be good enough, without having to feel like I need someone else's approval that I have to do so much because I'm afraid of not being good enough. Jesus, help us. Help us to write off this life. Help us to remember that we are spiritual beings having an earthly experience and not the other way around. Make us a people of one thing, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I just want to invite the prayer team up to the front. There's such a sweet sense of God's presence that's here. So if anything in this message touched your heart, or if you need hope, healing, or help uh, in any area, we have a team up here who'd love to pray for you. But for the rest of you, bless you. We love you. Go, uh, go rest today. In Jesus' name, take a Sabbath.